Hey everyone, Charlton here for Netflix's Three Body Problem, episode eight, the final episode, review and discussion. Uh, great place we've gotten to here. Uh, this series has ended strong. I give this episode a nine and a half out of 10. I would say I've got a lot to talk about. I'm probably just gonna jump right into the negatives uh, from the get-go and then get into a lot of things I really thought worked. Finally, I'm gonna be coming out with one more video, which is just a recap of the entire season and kind of a discussion of, you know, points that work, like the big overall themes that worked and didn't work, some of the other scientific concepts going on. You know, you're not gonna walk away from here without me getting nerding out on some, you know, small portion, you know, small detail, which probably should just be, you know, overlooked, but you know, that's going to happen. So, um, and finally, you know, just kind of give an overall breakdown and overall rating. Um, but that'll be coming out shortly now into episode eight. So first thing, first thing, number one point, number one, you know, thing that grinds my gears is, um, you know, you don't have to have everything with military and tactical, tactical stuff perfect. But, um, God, just a little more attention to detail. Okay, let's go. You t t what's wrong with this perimeter that, that they set around uh, the jet? Ready? What's, ro what's wrong with the perimeter? Are they, are they facing the right way? Um, and, okay, let's look here. Okay, how... This is what a defensive perimeter looks like. They're facing, they're facing outwards, okay? Um, not inwards, even once, you know, the person is in there. They're not going to shoot inwards at each other. Okay, so here's my rant, okay? Um, there's such a thing as like a military consultant on these shows. I think they may have had one. Um, they didn't use them probably enough. I'm telling you, they can't be that expensive right now, okay? We just got done, I don't, if anyone has noticed, we just got done two decades of fighting um, wars in the Middle East. And uh, there's a lot of people now that could use a job. So this is kind of just my petition, okay? Just like hire anyone who um, like did this as a job and then just like when you're doing something like this just like ask them like is this even you know you know does this work um you know there are scenes that and I, I know a lot of people might say that this show isn't about being a you know military recreation and action recreation um I strongly disagree this show is about being ultra realistic it, super internally consistent. It is a science fiction, political thriller, mystery, cosmic horror, all of the above. This show actually has the best opportunities to have like really well done details. I think someone in their calculus of what they need to make a successful show is like, oh, we, we need the big cinematic scenes, which they do and which they hit. Like the, they, you know, in, there's pro, in between the, you know, cargo ship cheese slicer and then the rocket launch in this episode, um, they're really, their cinematic scenes hit. Um, but that's to, that's not the only thing that makes people remember, you know, shows being great. Um, and, you know, teaching the audience, making it believable, making it immersive, um, making it not look low budget. So, um, I mean, now for me, you know, someone's actually been in the army, uh, not very good at any of the common infantry tactics, right? Doctor, doctor, okay. But, you know, the first unrealistic thing about that scene is, you know, you don't see a bunch of people like standing around slack jawing, okay? So, you know, you, know, you almost never see perfect, you almost never see perfect <laughs> formations. This isn't like synchronized swimming. And the other thing about the military that like, you know, there's just gear everywhere, people carrying around something that's too heavy for them, um, someone, you know, and then like maybe like a staging point, okay? I know these are details that are not necessary, but like they're, they're almost free. Um, so yeah, just do them. Okay, one point that I do think takes away from the story too. Um, 
the in making this they never really bought into the scope of the conflict they still think that this is something that people with you know high velocity um, rifles, you know, would be dealing with. But in reality, like this was always, you know, it wasn't a pull, you know, this, the ETO, right, which we've talked about a lot in the past, the, you know, the, the, they're not, they're a paramilitary organization, which means that you, they use tactics, you know, that are closer to like a military, you know, ace, what, even though they're fighting in an asymmetric manner, they're not limited to, you know, small arms. Okay. So if, if Saul is target number one, Maybe they should have, you know, an APC in the background. Uh, I mean, they could get an MRAP. Every police department now has an MRAP. I'm sure they are dying, dying to bring one out. They don't even need a CGI one here. Um, maybe some air defense. If I remember correctly, the scene where Saul is attacked leaving the UN, actually, they, I think, I, I, I'm sorry if I'm wrong on this, but I could swear they tried to shoot him with a missile combined with gun. Like, but that's the scope of the story. The story is, the you know, he's like the number one target on the earth for the aliens right now. Um, like, you know, it, th them trying to kill him at first with the car, you know, that was them doing it stealth. Okay, they've been found out. Clearly, they've been found out. Why are you going to pull any punches at this point? So you need more than just like, you know, a dude with a, you know, M4. Like, um... But, and now this goes back to this other riff that I'm gonna go off on, okay? I feel like there are two kinds of scenes in this show. There's the cinematic scenes. It's like D&D &D really wanted their chance to like direct a movie. And then there's the non-cinematic scenes, which are clearly given like second tier priority. So it, it would be one thing if the like special effects in the, you know, really high value scenes were way better and then the other ones had like no special effects. I understand that. But also like the dialogue and the scenarios are also much better in those scenes. And then you see the dialogue really lacking in other parts of the episode. So I, I almost feel like they had their like A team writer and then their B team writers it, it, separate that out. I may be reading too much into that and they that may be unfair. But now that I've done eight episodes, I got to tell you know, something's fishy on that um all uh, okay yeah uh, you know here we go is my invitation to consult on future episodes okay uh 20 million dollars per episode was the budget for this has been reported on okay um godzilla minus one the entire show in japan cost 15 million to make okay David and Daniel, where's the money? Where'd the money go, D and D? Where's the money? Um, this kind of gives off the vibe of being worth that much money, kind of. Um, but some of the parts that they cheaped out on, I just have to say, it's kind of inexcusable. So I can probably put together, you know three or four episodes at 20 million a pop, but where'd all the other money go? I think some people were having a lot of fun. Um, finally, uh, okay, last thing, last thing. This is a smaller thing, but I think this, again, this would have been easy if they had, again, anyone with like a, you know, security, military background. Um, if any of you have ever seen the video of Ron, Ronald Reagan get shot, okay, if you just, if you see how the security detail handles that, and by the way, Saul would easily just easily qualify for the same level. All right, he's already been had an attempted killing once. So you wouldn't be in like a relaxed, you know, um, protocol. You would be in a like everywhere he goes right now, you know, it's been 24 hours or 48 hours since they tried to kill him. They're going to try to kill him again, clearly, right? I understand the part where he dismisses him. They have to follow him. I understand that. But the other times when they're moving him, like you want like meat, in surrounding him like I know they kind of have formed up but you wouldn't just like Dashi just being on him you would want other people like really hugged um hugged up on him and you know just even make it you know like when he's in the car right I mean they could even do it like how they had you know secret service like the runners on the outside of the car they I, I think they could have hyped it up just a little bit more but they do a good job you know they do a good job they're coming that that's just me kind of nitpicking here um in terms of like capturing the essence of what needs to be done at this point in the show um and kind of hyping up how Saul you know is 
you know, humanity's best hope. Um, uh, I, I do think they, they get that across. And then going into the good, I mean, all the scenes when they land, you know, at the UN, it, I think it's really working. They have a number of actors and characters that execute well, you know, the UN Secretary General and then that, you know, UN liaison that they give him, the guy with the glasses. They're all, they all, it's not just the acting, it's the dialogue that's been written for him, the mannerisms. It's, it's similar to how it is in the book. Um, but again, you know, you always have, even if you're handed something on a silver platter, you have a chance to mess it up. And, you know, just the fact that they didn't mess it up and they still captured the essence, um, I think is very much praiseworthy. And I don't mean that tug in cheek. I really do mean that they, they captured it and it, it worked well. Um, I think the tempo of this, this, you know, going from episode seven to eight, you know, going from Yi's death right into Saul's death, um, it, the, you know, that sequence or uh, the attack on Saul, I'm sorry, Yi's death to the attack. So the attack on Yi to the attack on Saul is good. Um, I'm, excuse me again. I'm not sure, quite sure if that sequence is in the book like that, regardless, it's the story is internally consistent. That was something I actually pointed out in my last review. I'm like, well, if they went after Yi, they better be going after Saul too. So it actually, you know, and them simplifying the overall book one with a little bit of book two pulled in, um, they, I, they did a good job on that. And it, one of the general trends for my reviews is like episode four or five onwards, they've really been hitting critical points in a uh, coherent manner to tell a good, compelling story. I mean, I'll tell you, just, you know, bottom line up front, I am, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging on every episode now. I am very, I was very disappointed when I got to the end of episode eight and it was done and I know I've got to wait for season two now. Um, I really liked this, uh, really like this series and I would recommend it. I'll talk more about that in my next video in the total recap, but yeah, no, they, they pulled it together. Um, you know, very beginning of the episode, Nora, Nora getting run over was just so tragic. I think we all wanted to see more of Nora. Nora was talking a lot of sense here, just trying to talk and to solve some logic. Um, you know, that like logic, like it, it does exist in the book. Okay. Like the, just the show having like these people being really like, you know, kind of the, the Oxford Five at the beginning kind of being incoherent. That's not like how things are. You know, we, we needed more Noras earlier. We didn't need, you know, whatever happened in those first couple of episodes. Um, Saul, though, now, Saul, now that we know the point of Saul, he's a Luoji stand in. Um, it makes a lot of sense. His character does make a lot of sense. I still think that they could have had the character, you know, you, you didn't have to show his kind of lackadaisical characteristics all the way along. In fact, um, you know, some of the lines that the UN Secretary General tells to Saul, you know, it's like, this is a horrible job. Um, like, that's the reason, like, Saul doesn't, or Luoji doesn't want to do the job. It's, I mean, it's just beyond him, right? I mean, beyond his scope, right? So, yeah. Speaking into things that are really good, uh, so yeah, that UN Secretary General, Jesus Christ, she acted the hell out of that uh, that role. So I was like, who is this? Okay, it, it turns out the actress is like super famous. I don't know her because I don't watch a lot of TV, but she's been in a lot of stuff. So I guess CCH Pounder is her name. Uh, she nail the reason she nails what I would say is a very difficult role to execute on. I mean, she, to me, in sci-fi, so first thing, like, you're asking someone who's, like, a very established, you know, actor to, you know, come into a sci-fi series and, you know, execute a, um, com you know, a uh, convincing role. I think that's hard. Um, I, I think the president um, in uh, uh, The Expanse, she does a good job, um, but I actually think that, CCH Pounder does a better job, um, and I'll tell you why, okay? So, I mean, first thing, her all, like, exposition and leading the UN uh, during that really important scene, I mean, that played out exactly like it did in my mind. For I, I do think it's kind of BS if I would rate a show based on did it play out in the show exactly as it played out in my mind? That's not a fair way to rate a show. Um, but, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, this is my YouTube review, and the fact that it 
nailed exactly the vibe and the ambiance I had in my mind and did so well. You, at, at some point you have to say like, bravo, well done. Like, at least for me, that, that, you know, see that sequence worked perfectly. I also think that the author, you know, Sishin Liu, when he was writing it, was kind of writing a made for TV, made for a movie scene. So I, I, I think there is a reason it worked so well. Um, but again, the UN Secretary General, CCH Pounder, when she meets with Saul in the room afterwards, I mean, she comes across as like the most leader leader I've seen in the show. And actually, this is kind of where Wade was lacking, unfortunately. Um, she hits him with like all these different things that you see in people of power and leaders. OK, she's like she's sympathetic to Saul. She doesn't hesitate in pointing out what they both know. She respects his, you know, um, intelligence. She's like, yeah, clearly this is a horrible um, job, but she's also like motivational, but also that goes with being like slightly manipulative, right? Because like the best leader that like, they do manipulate people. Um, and finally, she's like, you know, kind of terse and brief, like you would expect someone to be in a position of power, but it still reflects correctly that, you know, Saul Luoji is so important to her system that of course she would make time for him. Um, like really well acted. Like, um, and this is ugh, this is throwing shade at everyone. I'm sorry. Okay, but is she like one of the only people who like really read or like really researched the materials to like then know exactly how to act out the scene or? There's one other theory I have, and again, this is throwing shade at, again, one of my favorite actors. Please don't take this too personally. All right. Um, a lot of my problems with, um, you know, Wade, I mean, he's acted by one of my favorite actors from the Game of Thrones series. Um, it either seems like he's doing a scene where he, like, is establishing that he's an asshole, or then he's, like, you know, doing his normal, like, boss scene. In reality, like I mean, being in the military and working in the medical field, right, and like really high stakes environment all the time. Like I've worked under plenty of people who are, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of throw daggers at you. And you know, I mean, I, I probably a couple times have been accused of, you know, throwing daggers. You know, kind of having some sharp edges to me. Um, and the way that's done, like first thing, these are, I, I wonder if these are skills that can actually be act like can be. Um, gained if you haven't lived that life like that's one of those questions that comes up like if you're like an actor out you know living in santa monica you know walking on the beach and you know talking about high-minded things like can you really show up you know day one because i tell you as soon as these videos are done i'm back to you know busting my ass in the hospital and you know probably getting yelled at by someone you know higher rank than me somewhere you know if you're an actor can you really like you know put your claws into that and uh, and have that, um, you know, have that uh, way of thinking. I mean, I think it goes back, like, why did Michael Crichton make ER season one and two so convincing? Well, he literally went from the ER, you know, from being a doctor to writing the show. Like, that's how you do it. Um, so, you know, people who are like leaders who have limited budgets, constant stress, you know, they will still, you know, have good interactions with their subordinates but sometimes it'll be very terse it will be sharp you might have barbs like i mean God, this is horrible I, I probably shouldn't do this but let me just try to act out a scene you know where you know i'm being you know one of my nurses is coming to me and i'm busy it's like you head down you know head down someone walks in like all right i can talk to you if i have like one minute but you got to be quick and so anyway, something like that. Um, or, you know, and that's just not what I saw from Wade. Um, I, what I saw from Wade was, again, um, some parts really worked and he eventually did get into that character. But I do think, you know, it, it, it should have been just slightly differently done. OK, in my, you know, takedown on Wade, it, he ended up working much better than that. Don't let that be reflective of any overall, you know. Again, in Game of Thrones was probably the best acted character, you know, full stop. Okay. Um, the Wall Facers. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so a change from the books. Um, instead of four Wall Facers, you get three. Um, I was At first, I was going to critique that, and then I thought, wait, if I had to make this just a little more simple, 
yeah, having one person who specializes in classical warfare, one spe person who specializes in asymmetric warfare, and then our scientist who was just picked for shits and giggles, like, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so that works. My only regret is you'll never get to uh, meet, uh, unless they have someone else be like him, but you're never going to get to meet Manuel Ray Diaz, um, who just symbolizes so much just... I, I'm one of my favorite characters. Um, essentially, he turns uh, light spoilers, but he, he, you know, he's the original, like, let's turn this whole situation into a Mexican standoff um, situation. And um, <laughs> he ends up meeting a fate that's kind of tough. But yeah, the wall facers are the best, um, best part of, like, I think the entire series. Um, so don't, you know, please don't screw them up in season two. I hope there's a season two. You guys deserve a season two. Um, yeah, but, um, you know, introduction's good. I, th I, I think they're going in the right direction. Um, oh, by the way, one other big point, even with any of the follies from season one, it has not poisoned the future material. I'll go into that more detail in my next video, but there's no reason to believe, you know, after anything, any of these like slight missed, slight to medium missteps in season one, everything is still going strong. So as exemplified by still having two quality, you know, wall facer candidates outside of Saul, um, you know, it's been well thought through and I, I, I consider it still a labor of love. Um, small, small D. Oh yeah. And then, yeah. And then just talking about the wall face or liaison, I already kind of did. He did a very good job. Um, you know, the scene where they bring in the guy who shot him, um, is well done. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's cool to see Saul start exercising his power. Um, Okay, so the uh, launch scene, I mean, that's as good as it gets. I mean, wow, wow. Uh, great CGI, great science tie-in. Um, I always thought then the nukes were actually, you know, if this is your probe, right? And then, you know, your probe and your sail. I thought the nukes were like detonated behind everything, you know, because a lot of the plans with the original like solar sail plans were either to just use photons, you know, the energy, the kinetic energy captured of a photon, which is very small. But if you have no resistance, you get, you know, unlimited acceleration from it. So like all the classic solar sail plans have been like that. And then there's always been, you know, a plan where you shoot a laser at it to accelerate it. Um, I always thought the nukes were farther back, but honestly, like, I don't even care. Like threading the needle, I, that may have been how it was done in the books. I, I got to be honest at some points in it, I wasn't a hundred percent sure of what was going on still, but yeah, threading the needle, the nuke was actually where the nanofiber is. So clearly the nanofiber could survive the nuke, um, which is wild. Um, finally, you know, I, I told you I'm going to force some, some piece of science knowledge down your throat every video. So um, the radiation from the nuke going off, I think probably would have been really tough on uh, uh, his brain. Um, so he would have been still kind of close to the detonation. So, um, yeah, so what happens? So, you know when a nuclear, you know, a fit, these are fusion devices, um, but you get a lot of neutrons created, um, and neutrons do a lot of uh, damage to normal tissues, like your brain, um, and you can't really shield them, like if that, even if that capsule was lined with lead, which we know it's not because they were trying to cut weight, um, get a lot of neutrons. So he's going to show up to the uh, Trisolarans probably with some cancer or a lot of DNA damage. Um, I don't know what the radiation dose would necessarily be, um, but it would be a lot. It's not like fallout because you're not so activating because there's nothing. It's just a vacuum of space, but you actually do, you know, get, you know, neutrons just expand out from the initial, you know, fit, fission fusion explosion. Um, it's the same thing with like cosmic, you know, the cosmic rays, the really high power, you know, atoms that are going through um, outer space, you know, either, you know, alpha, alpha particles, which is, you know, two protons, two neutrons, or I think there's iron nuclei sometimes um, that are, the thing is they're going like near the speed of light. 
Um, and then when they hit anything, they do way more damage than a normal like photon or electron because they have mass to them and they're going so fast. Like if they hit your DNA, they end up making it a single piece of DNA. It becomes a shotgun blast. Same kind of with the neutrons. Okay. I, anyway, uh, thanks for listening. If you're still here. Um, Oh yeah, one part, you know, when the ship starts to steer off course, the dialogue in that room is like perfect. I mean, it sounds like they watch, at the very least they watch Apollo 13, but yeah, kind of that pause and then the guy being like, can I get a second check on this? I tell, if I'm saying that, that's always the sign that something is bad. It's like, can I get another set of eyes on that? That's like the real, like, you don't want to be there for that. Um, and then finally, another good thing, you know, that the last scene of the in episode eight, you know, where they're out there with the cicadas, um, you know, that that's kind of what I've been hoping more that Dashi was going to deliver that this entire show. Um, you know, my, my, my questions about acting aren't just confined to, I think, is it Liam Cumming Cunningham, but also to, you know, Benedict Wong. Um, they, you know... Okay, again, I hate to say this, but I think if you have to compare the dashis between the Chinese version and the English version, either by script or by acting, the Chinese version wins. Um, the, you know, it pains me to say that. I mean, have you guys seen The Wall, um, that uh, Matt Damon film? Like, that's not an easy watch for anyone. I mean, that was Chinese Hollywood. Um, but yeah, but the Chinese dashi, um, just in a mixture of um, kind of reserved uh cynical burnt outness and but then like true caring um he he delivers that more than the dashi of the netflix version does i think it's fixable and i i see sparks there so um it, it's just kind of a bummer though because book one was really you know is really dashi's like moment to shine and they just the script de-emphasized him we'll talk about that more in you know my next review all right, what else is uh, bad? Well, this isn't so much bad, but it's just something that goes along with the Dashi point. So there's a character who's um, in the book who's a general called Chang Wasi. Um, he would have been, losing th that character in the TV series really hurts Dashi's character because that's kind of the person who worked with Dashi in the past and is kind of the bridge between the big science and the day-to-day -day, like, you know, the crimes on earth that are related to the upcoming invasion. I mean, Dashi is a police officer slash detective with military background. So losing that character, I know they had to scrub some characters, but losing that hurt Dashi. And as I told you before, as much as anyone thinks that the other characters are really important parts of book one, I think, you know, the Dashi, Dashi is just as important as Wang and Wang was given five separate characters, you know, of importance. So there's that. Um, one of the lines that Chang does in the uh, book, just to give you an idea of like the person delivering this dialogue. And so I think it would have been great to have this. So one of my, one of the comments on my, on my lap, on episode five was I love, I love this episode. I agree. Like this episode gave me that same eerie vibe that the last time I got it was when I watched the matrix. Yes. Bingo. That is exactly, exactly what they should be going for with the series. Um, so one of uh, Chang Wasi's vibe was, lines is, Chang gave him an inscrutable smile. You will know more soon. Everyone will know, Professor Wang. Have you ever had anything happen to you that changed your life completely? Some event where afterward the world became a totally different place for you? The entire history of humankind has been, a for has been fortunate. From the Stone Age till now, no real crisis has occurred. We've been very lucky. But if it's all luck, then it has to end one day. Let me tell you, it's ended. Prepare for the worst. Like that line, like I would have just delivered it straight up in the TV show because it, it encapsulates so much. Maybe you could do it during a montage. Um, and then finally, finally, and then finally, there, there, you know, there's a short cutaway to Augie, um, this last episode. Um, I'm, I've like been rooting for her to start being like coming into her own self-actualization because I feel like it hasn't happened. 
Um, and, you know, like in this episode, I think it's working. Like, she's a very believable character, um, you know, kind of doing that whole, uh, you know, detaching um, and focusing on herself. And I think that works. Um, the, you know, the, the, the corporate side was just just the acting didn't work so again i'm hoping that you know given who we think augie is going to be i hope uh season two just kind of retools you know her your prompts and her um uh motivations and her lines um because you know definitely could work all right so wow we've made it through all eight episodes we'll have the full recap full summary um but again you know Great end to the show. Great end. Um, I, I, I think it has done justice to the books. But uh, we'll talk about that more next time. All right, y'all have a good day. Goodbye.